So we have a very, very important speaker who is taking his time to spend time with us and share his experience. If you don't want to hear it now, that's fine. Go outside. If somebody is still talking, please encourage them to go outside. There's nice places where people can talk, but I'm hoping that we can have the utmost respect for our speaker. Because, excuse me. If people are talking, please encourage them to stop or to go out. They can just keep talking. I want to welcome to the stage an amazing, amazing Georgian man who has spent time building a company through the years and has taken his time out while in Georgia to share that experience. He wants to inspire, he wants to educate. Let's give a very big welcome to Tom, Tomas Giorgadze. All right, so let's jump into it because uh, we have to be more interesting than whatever else is going on in the audience. Um, so it, is, is this about the crowd when we said we wanted you to speak to a meetup? This is about the same as you thought? Yeah, I'm humbled. I think this is the biggest crowd I had alone. So <laughs> please bear with me if I'm uh, uh, like not uh, uh, at par or on par with your expectations. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, so uh, as I mentioned to, to Tomas before, um, the Startup Grind Belisi chapter is one of the, the best in the world. This crowd you don't see in very many places in the world. So uh, be very proud. Uh, and if, again, if there are people who are talking, please encourage them uh, to, to go outside. So I'm going to start from the beginning. Uh, I know a lot of times I've seen you on YouTube, you were talking about the business, you're talking about the fintech space, and, and very specific things about your industry. Startup Grind is more about the story of you as a founder. So where did you grow up, and what did you want to do when, when you, you were an uh, adult? So I grew up in uh, Kutaisi, uh, in Imereti, um, and um, was uh, there actually until uh, I was 12 when I um, finished my school. Um, uh, so uh, I was kind of a wunderkind back then, or like uh, jumped for, uh, for classes. Then I went to Tbilisi, started uh, at the State University, um, graduated there in 94, and worked for one year in the office of Shevardnadze back then. Uh, it was, I mean, like some of the people probably don't remember it in the room, but it was a really, really dark time in Georgia. So, like many Georgians back then decided that uh, there is ample opportunity outside and made my PhD then in Germany. Uh, stayed there for until now, so I live in Berlin now. And my first job, my first proper job was at uh, McKinsey, uh, so I was a consultant uh, for the banking industry. I uh, stayed at McKinsey very long, so for 10 years actually, made uh, to, I think, one of the youngest partners in McKinsey with 29, and uh, then, uh, yeah, decided that uh, I need a change, uh, and then started uh, Raisin, so that's a short bio. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, that was a good start. No. Um, <laughs> no. um, so very good. So um, so after school, uh, one of your first jobs was working working with the government. Uh, what uh, what was that experience like? Yes. Yeah, so I I, I can't uh, exactly remember my uh, my first salary, but I think it was definitely below hundred coupon. Uh, so if uh, people remember, so that was uh, fun times. And I think the biggest uh, pride uh, of my family was that uh, on Christmas we were given I think one liter of sunflower oil and three liters of kerosene. So everyone was happy and warm at home. Um, so the time was really really messy. I had uh, my first uh, real mentor actually uh, there, uh, which was Gela Chakviani, for whom I worked uh, for a year, and uh, I learned actually at least the uh, virtues of a mentorship and when people take time to develop others. So that was a really cool experience at the end. Okay, great. So you, you mentioned, uh, you know, you went on to, to found Raisin. <clears throat> when, did the, when did the idea for uh, this company come to your mind? I mean, the, the name was, was different when you started. But, but really, originally, when did, when did that idea come to you? Yep. So, um...
Actually, it has also something to do with, uh, with uh, Georgia, um, because uh, I worked for one of the two largest banks uh, in this country uh, as a McKinsey consultant. And um, so uh, McKinsey partners started asking me, you know, we're serving this bank in Georgia. It seems to be paying the fees. So they are serious guys, obviously, um, and I've seen that they are paying back then, I don't know, like 8% on, on euro accounts. So can you please open for me the euro account? And I started really doing that, like transporting papers forth and back. Uh, and uh, um, that was one of the reasons. The other one, actually, I professionally dealt with uh, savings and investments. I was responsible for that inside McKinsey for, for the EMEA region. And uh, around the crisis, realized that actually a lot of banks uh, had appetite to gather more of that stuff uh, and that there was uh, really some space uh, in the platform business. So combined a couple of things and uh, idea first appeared which I wrote down also on a two-pager 2008 um, and I didn't found 2008. Uh, so um, and the reason was my co-founder was actually lukewarm to be honest and he's a lawyer so he founded a law firm afterwards which is really successful. He has more than 100 lawyers now so he's super happy but I think he was not into, into the fintech uh, so much. And the other reason was that the um, first investors whom I talked to said back then uh, actually, where's the urgency for the customer? Deutsche Bank was paying back then 5% on, uh, on uh, uh, online deposits. So that uh, uh, I wrote it down, I talked to investors, I shelved it for another four years. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so you had the original idea in, in 2008, and then uh, the, the moment wasn't there. Um, you were working at, at the time at McKinsey? <clears throat> That's correct. Yeah. Do you, do you want to say a little bit about what that experience at McKinsey was like? So, um, I think one thing or my uh, general recommendation is um, before founding something, you need to have a proper job because to learn, it's uh, better to do it in an established environment. Uh, so for me, McKinsey was that established environment. Like, what does McKinsey do? Um, it's a consulting. Um, so that uh, people come in from the university, they have no clue of anything and try to tell other people how to do stuff which they do on a day-to-day -day level, which sounds uh, really crazy so that you have to do be good in some other things which those people uh, are not. So uh, actually uh, McKinsey is very good at uh, structuring, at storytelling and making complex issues simple and simpler to decide. So that, that is actually the whole thing you are learning the first three to five years is to analyze, structure, tell a good story, come quickly to decisions. Um, and that helped a lot uh, later. As in any organization, it uh, learning curve flattens out. So after uh, five years, uh, I, yeah, I realized that the marginal value of my time spent for myself was decreasing. Okay, so very interesting work, but you, know, you already had, uh, had, had a plateau there. So what, what made that transition from a uh, Pretty good. I mean, you were a partner at McKinsey, right? Like that's a pretty good job as as jobs go. What what was the thing that pushed you over the edge? Like, why did you go do a crazy thing like start a startup? It is so that story has also to do with Georgia. So one of my best friends. So McKinsey is good at uh, a couple of things. One is attracting good people, but because uh, you sit together in those team rooms, you have a um, feeling that you are in the same trench, and there is the client who is nervous and uh, demanding, and uh, and you sit there and become friends with those people. So one of uh, these guys, uh, actually, who was intern on his first project on my project, I, I was kind of friend and we went together to Georgia, I think it was uh, 2011, and we're in mountains in Svaneti, and he came to me and said, Thomas, you know what, I will be leaving the company because all the guys I know from the university are becoming really rich in the startup area, and we at McKinsey are working a lot and still creating profits for others, so for partners like you, for senior partners, so let's do something where we can get really rich. And I said, okay, I like that guy actually, so let's uh, give it a try. And two weeks later, we sat with three ideas uh, with a um, guy who was my client, uh, who was a senior banking guy, and uh, with uh, wine and steaks, presented him those three ideas and asked for his advice, whether he would 
do any of the three and he picked up actually the raisin idea and uh, threatened us that if we won't do it he will do it himself in six months and the threat was semi-credible because he found it before a mortgage uh, brokerage platform so not too far away from deposit brokerage platform so that uh, then uh, we decided to go with it <laughs> so that's a good sign when your investor says it's a good enough idea that they'll they'll do it as a business themselves huh? okay great and and so what uh, what initially uh, were you able to raise, uh, and, and what sort of justification did you have, uh, or you know, what sort of rationale did you have for, for justifying the, the money? Yes, yeah, so we um, raised uh, for the initial phase quite a lot. So we raised uh, two million actually from angel investors, um, and angel investors being friends and family. So like uh, none of them, or like I think almost none of them has done any VC investment before. Um, and why uh, we came up with 2 million, uh, it was actually an outcome of the business case saying that 2 million would allow us to launch the product and have six months for data. So that we have two months to uh, look at the data, set up a pitch deck and another two months to close the round. So quite, uh, quite a tight uh, time plan, but exactly worked out like that. Uh, so the fundraise took a bit less time, uh, uh, but uh, that was actually two million of angel money which helped us to that point. Great. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting uh, point, is when you're fundraising to have very clear plan for how you're going to spend it, what it's going to get you, and a clear rationale. Because I think sometimes <clears throat> young entrepreneurs maybe uh, feel they want a certain amount of money, uh, but they haven't really specified very, very cleanly and clearly uh, why they need it and what the outcomes are going to be. So I think that's, that's very interesting. Um, so you maybe had a little bit more, uh, you know, sort of background with numbers than most, uh, most young founders might, I would think. Yes, so I mean uh, about the uh, fundraise, so um, that's actually always a, um, a very stringent process you're running because first thing is of course you need to know how to spend it, the second thing you need to know what uh, investors are expecting. So uh, in the first phase, so when you go into series A, they expect that you have a product and some crazy digital people click on it but nothing more happening. So the product works and that's it and the team is good. Um, and series B, people uh, already expect that you have really two or three channels where you really can throw money on. And uh, to prove that actually is the hardest thing because of course you get some small channels which work but they're not scalable and then they have uh, some big channels that you can scale but they cost crazy money for the acquisition. And to find this narrow set of channels which are scalable and cheap up to a certain point, that's a real, real challenge. We struggled also with it uh, a lot. And then if you go into Series C, then the thing is like, okay, the thing works, product market fit is there, it is scalable in one country, prove us you can do it in a lot of countries. And uh, that's also how we raised Series C, so we promised, so we didn't promise, we actually launched in uh, Raising.com for 31 countries, and then, and then you take it from there. So I think then the fundraisers are more standardized because you're funding a, a growth model uh, afterwards. Okay, great. <clears throat> and so in, in terms of your, your A round, the first sort of conventional venture capital uh, investment, who, who, who came with you on that ride, and, uh, and how did that come about? So, so fun thing was uh, we um, so as structured as we are, we had our like perfect pitch deck and uh, it was really good. We had an Excel table with all dream VCs we had in our mind, and um, we had a board call and said, okay, people were going now out into the market and said, yeah, let's go out, press the button. And actually uh, that day, um, a guy from Index Ventures uh, uh, popped into our office and said, hey, he was like really excited. His name is Philip and said, hey, let's go for a coffee and, um, and okay, let's go for a coffee. And he said, uh, you know what? I've heard about the idea. Uh, can you send me the pitch deck today? But just to me, like before you go out. And I sent it out. The same evening he calls me and said, actually, founder of Index, Neil Reimer, wants to have you in Geneva. Can you make it this week still? Okay, we go to Geneva. So I went to Geneva, that went well, and uh, Neil said, you know what, we have on Monday, we have a partners meeting in London. So it was like actually in like five working days. So Monday, we have a meeting in London, can you come over to Monday? And yeah, sure, we can come over to Monday. And then Monday afternoon, they decided that they want uh, to lead the round. Uh, 
Uh, and I think so afterwards, because Philip worked with us, I knew that we had the highest positive vote of partners. They had uh, like uh, a yes and no uh, uh, difference. So uh, that was really cool and easy. Uh, but uh, so the other fundraisers were not so easy as the first one. <laughs> All right, so it's nice to have a little bit of luck thrown in with the, the good, uh, good business model. Okay, so Index, so tell me a little bit about Index Ventures. Like, uh, what, were, what were they like as a partner and, and why, uh, you know, how has it been working with them? So Index, I think, is one of the very few European venture funds. and. Uh, but it's not really European because uh, it's a it's a founder-led uh, company, very unusual for VCs, uh, and it's a family. So it's a father and two sons who founded that, and they are Canadians. So they came for tax reasons uh, to Switzerland, um, and they founded uh, Index Ventures there. Um, what I liked about the uh, company is um, it's really big but it feels like family, so um, they are very much values driven, uh, so I've never heard anything bad about them acting against founders or against the interest of the company. Um, the um, other thing is they are well connected um, across the industry, so uh, actually they introduced us all follow-on investors at the end. Uh, so. Um, that's that was really cool, and uh, um, and the last thing I like is they do a really cool founders event. So invite CEOs of all their companies. One is in two years. It's in Sonoma Valley in California. It's a very good hotel, and uh, really cool people show up there. So uh, they value very, very much networking for their founders as well. So it's uh, it's a good experience. So really build that community of their of their uh, grantees or their uh, investees. <clears throat> Great. So, so let's look at the the sort of the, the big picture. Um, you you mentioned 2008. You'd been thinking about this project, and then the numbers maybe worked out a better later. Um, what is the what is the core business concept that you entered uh, the market with, and that you were pitching original uh, investors on? So the um, original idea was to offer to clients anywhere in the world, uh, basically. Um, account openings anywhere else in the world. So we started, of course, in a country. So for Germans to be open, to uh, to be able to open savings accounts in Georgia, Kazakhstan was another country which we where we signed up even a bank. South Africa, Australia, and I think also something in South America we had. Uh, so we raised money for that, um, and uh, actually, so it's a supervised business model, so we had to go to the regulator, uh, and uh, we sent our file to the regulator, and to our complete surprise, there are two ways regulator goes. So one way is they'll ask a lot of questions and try to stop you. The other one is they ask for a business case, how much capital do you have, and who are the shareholders, and they went the second route to our complete surprise. So they asked, like, what is the business case, how much capital you're putting in, and we were, like, super happy, until, um, until in the next letter, I tried to a bit uh, be more cautious and asked whether they have seen a particular circular from 2004 issued by BaFin. Turned out they didn't see that uh, circular before, and from this very positive, it came to you will never launch that business model in Germany because we will outright forbid it. <laughs> so, uh, so at the end, uh, yeah. So we ended up uh, in our basement uh, saying, okay, we built something, but it's not usable. <laughs> So, so you had this idea, it seemed like a very good idea, and you had gotten some investment at this point, right? So, and then the regulator said, you, you can't do it. And actually a friend of mine has a very similar story, but a little different. Um, so what happened then? I mean, you have these investors who are like, uh, this sounded like a good idea, but this doesn't sound like a good idea anymore. Like, what happened then? So yeah, a lot of things happen. So what happens, first thing is you kind of have to tell it to your investors because they would expect this. And uh, given the fact that none of them had any experience with VC investment, actually two came back and said, give me back my money. Um, 
Well, okay, cool. So it was a risky investment. You realized that, yeah, but I signed up for a different thing. So you tell us you're doing this global thing and now doing European things, so I want my money back. Uh, um, so then yeah. one of my co-founders came back and said, you know what, I think it's a bit smaller than when I originally placed. I might be leaving the company, actually. Uh, yeah, so we had a couple of very nervous months uh, in the summer of 2013. So, so you had both the investors, the, the investors were wanting to pull out and your founder, co-founder was wanting to pull out, like, how did you how did you recover from that? Like, what did you do and what happened? So actually, it has also to do with uh, Georgia. So at um, uh, Bank of Georgia, I met a very cool guy, El Breach, uh, who is uh, today not here. But uh, I met him at a Champions League game uh, where Bank of Georgia kindly invited me to pursue it to join the board. And um, that guy has heard my story and said, you know what, if he wants to go out, we will actually buy him out. So he brought in investors who were willing to pay um, actually the same valuation, same amount as, as the previous round. And we bought that guy out, who is right now extremely unhappy, by the way. So uh, every time I see him, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't react uh, well on me. Um, so we bought that guy out. And uh, uh, my co-founder, I think it was like three weeks of daily coaching, discussions, and thoughts, and scenario planning, and then he said, okay, let's give it a try until the end of the year. So we stabilized that one as well. <laughs> well, good save, as they say. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and so it sounds like there's, there's a couple things. One is it sounds like the, the power of networks, that you happen to be networked with people <clears throat> in the banking space who got what you were doing and excited, and so we were able to, to bring in some new people. Also, you know, a good sound core business idea. I mean, obviously, if those folks are ready to, to jump on it, and, and a little bit of uh, persuasive uh, human resource management to, to inspire it. So, did he, to, so the founder that was ready to jump ship, did he stay with the company, or did he later leave, or what happened with that? I think we are one of the very few companies where all three founders after six years are still, still there. So we, we are all still there, and uh, yeah, love spending time with each other, actually. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so in the team, in the core team, like a lot of a lot of times, um, uh, new founders uh, want to be solopreneurs and they want to do it themselves, or they want to do it with their buddy, you know, who they went to went to middle school with or whatever. Um, but what what was your experience of of the founding team and how did you like decide on that team and <clears throat> what would you say to people who are thinking about? who to found with? So um, actually, uh, we, uh, oh, I thought a lot about that, and I thought three is a very good number. Why is three is a very good number? Because uh, when two fight, there is no way to have a majority. Uh, and you always need a majority, because you start fighting on small things at some point in time, and you need and you to level yourself, your craziness out. So three is a good number. Uh, the other thing is um, what we found useful is that we all worked with each other in different constellations, so we knew actually what we are, uh, what we're expecting. So because I worked with both guys at least three to five years together in, in single rooms. So that, uh, that was, that's I think, basic precondition because once people do not know each other and get in the same room, it's difficult. So you need some six months to, to adjust, uh, and six months is a long time for a startup. The third thing is the we all came from McKinsey, so uh, a bit weird and hard to explain to the investors, but completely different profiles. So one of my co-founders is a CFA. He loves numbers, details, uh, audit reports, uh, all the stuff which I hate. Um, the second guy is a pro gamer, so he was one of the worldwide best in Unreal Tournament, uh, and uh, he calls himself, so uh, he wanted to do ops and IT, and I volunteered because I've done a lot of B2B sales in, uh, in McKinsey as well, so I've volunteered for the B2B part of uh, marketplace and actually product development, so, uh, uh, and legal and some other stuff which, uh, which I cover. Okay, so this is a little weird though, because you're, you're a Georgian founder and you're doing sales. And uh, a, a lot of the startups here um, are not strong on sales. So um, is that something that you really liked to do? Or how did, how did you end up with those sales skills that have really helped you uh, bring the company up? So um, actually, day one, you 
uh, get your hands dirty. And what is dirt in my business? Dirt is uh, so we didn't have uh, we we promised a marketplace, but we didn't have a single bank and a single customer. So you somehow need to load those banks on the platform. And uh, first thing I tried is of course to go through the network. So I had a lot of numbers from from McKinsey clients, and uh, all of them declined uh, for a simple reason because uh, it would put their uh, jobs on the line of uh, a fire because uh, they are doing a body business with someone which is not established uh, so that uh, then uh, I used my other skills so as a student I jobbed a lot of different jobs one of them was uh, I was doing cold calling for a headhunter so I picked up the phone and my day is like first three months I was doing coming into the office doing three hours of cold calling uh, banks really going through the call center Buongiorno in Italy and all this stuff and trying to get to the right person and to persuade him in the phone to get a meeting. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, how you do it, yeah. Yeah, so you'd been sort of through the trenches uh, already and, <clears throat> and, and developed that, uh, that tough skin. Um, let me take a little uh, pause here. And so folks who are in the audience, we're, we're trying a new uh, technology. We are a, a startup oriented entity, so we got to try some new tools. Uh, so one of the companies that Startup Grind has worked with uh, for a number of years is, uh, is Slido. And there's these little slips of paper. If you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and you put in 5825, you can uh, ask questions. So we're going to have some time for questions at the end. But at, the, uh, at this time, you can also ask questions, and I'll be monitoring. So I, I'm, I'm not uh, checking my stock ticker or something. I'll be, I'll be monitoring the questions. So, um, so sounds good. So <clears throat> what I, going, going back a little bit, um, I wanted to ask you, when, when you were growing up in, in Kutaisi, when you were growing up in Georgia, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh. <laughs> So uh, when, like, when I was really, really young, um, I uh, actually uh, w was kind of being trained for a chess career. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, that dream stopped at eight because uh, I think a combination of my teachers, parents, and myself realized that uh, uh, either I try to do everything for the chess career and stop going to the school or do the proper learning at school. So that was my first dream uh, career. And then um, I actually didn't know until uh, until uh, the next anecdote story. So uh, one of my best friends in the university, uh, when I was graduating law, so I was uh, completely outside of business side, uh, uh, said that uh, he was at a, an event by, uh, by this consulting company. I'd never had uh, the name before of, of those McKinsey guys. And they were paying a whole weekend, um, and the weekend was in Rome, and I was never in Rome before. So I said, okay, if that guy goes to Rome for free, I want to do it as well. So I applied for this Rome weekend fully covered, both expenses and food. And uh, uh, yeah, back then I had actually basically no money, so it was a big, a good deal. And uh, that's how I ended up in being a generalist consultant. All right, so the HR people in the audience, uh, if you want to recruit really good talent, uh, take them to Rome for a few days and uh, give, give a bit of a, a, bit of a, a trip there. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so, so the original idea with, um, <clears throat> with uh, Raisin, or you know, the earlier iteration, was this international banking marketplace. Um, it got kind of pulled back to this European uh, marketplace play. Um, you had Index, uh, w at what point did Index uh, enter? Like what, what did you have to show them for them to want to invest in your company? Because they're, yeah, like you said, they're pretty serious folks, uh, you know, founder driven uh, VC company and really, really smart folks. So how do you, how do you make the case? Um, so actually the case which we made was uh, we're attacking a very big market. So, um, and the big market for us is only in Europe we have uh, 20, 12 trillion in, uh, in uh, savings, in private savings. So uh, that's a huge market. And um, uh, the model which we do, no one else does. And it's by far better for the customer because he can choose of an infinite number of banks at one place instead of going through online applications uh, one by one. So that the model kind of 
sounded very clear and clean uh, and the market sounded very big. And uh, we said uh, the product is already there, so you can click and you can open accounts and it works. And we had already, I think, first around 500 to 1,000 clients, so that there were first people who were already using it, and that is enough for a Series A. Um, but I think like one thing is uh, don't forget about the big markets. Uh, that's really, really important. Yeah, and I think that's something that first-time founders maybe don't take uh, enough into account. Because for, for you know an angel or a VC to invest a certain amount, they have to you know have that really big upside. Otherwise, otherwise it doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, <clears throat> so how long did you run on that, and uh, what were you able to show at the end of your of your A round when you were approaching for B? Yeah. So B was for us the hardest round which we raised. Um, uh, sorry, so B was uh, was not as hard. C was hard, but B was um, uh, so. B, people expect that you have extremely good numbers on sales, uh, sales channels. You understand how much you pay for the customer, where can you scale, uh, what are the channels you are, uh, like up to which traffic numbers you can go per channel. And this is something which we have built actually very well roughly one, hours later, well, one year later uh, and had a real marketplace already. So we had around 10 banks, uh, the model was working well and we had a, a flurry of numbers with uh, extremely good outcome on a on couple of channels, on three, four channels. We had a very good feeling. So we went with it out, we talked with two VCs and got two term sheets back and then decided very fast and it uh, ended up to be a specialist VC uh, called Ribbit Capital from California. They do a lot of fintech but they only do fintech so that uh, majority of people never heard of them. Cool. Um, let me throw in a, a couple questions from the audience here. Um, OG, uh, whoever that is, says, what is the future of banks in the long term? Do you think their business model will adapt, be totally disrupted, or complemented by the, the firms that have a little bit more of this uh, technology-friendly uh, orientation? As I'm on the board of Bank of Georgia, I of course believe that the banks will survive. Uh, um, so um, I think uh, more seriously uh, that um, uh, I think the business model of banks will change and has to change um, a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, actually startups are helping them in that uh, because they are, they are pressing on the pain points. So if nothing is wrong, then no startup will win. And actually many things are wrong in a, in a, in a banking business model. And I think the biggest thing is and the most difficult to align the interests of uh, the financial service provider and the client. And uh, the banks are in the worst starting situation because you only earn money at client's expense. And it's very, very hard because you're actually cutting up the pie in two. And if you cut the pie, you tend to give the other side a bit, a bit less. Uh, and I think that's the that's the thing that needs uh, that needs healing. And uh, so we partner with a lot of banks. I mean, we have banks, 70 banks, to whom we provide funding. But we also partner with the likes of BBVA and uh, uh, and uh, and others. Uh, and O2 Telefonica uh, and N26 to give our API to them so that they can give the same service to their clients. And I think banks like exactly that because you are opening up your plat own platform and acting as a good citizen and as a help. Great. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll come back to that sort of opening the APIs um, and how banks can, can inter interact with, uh, with fintechs. Um, there was another question um, on this topic of, of geography. Um, what are the chances that uh, Georgian banks are going to be able to participate in, in Raisin uh, platform and, and what are the barriers to that or, or what will happen there? So, um, yeah, we, we would love to. Um, I think uh, we like specifically uh, do not see currently a regulatory framework to, to, to um, launch it in Europe. Uh, the reason being uh, that um, the regulators quite commonly see it as, a, as, a, as an active market entry, meaning that Bank of Georgia would need a fully full license or a subsidiary in somewhere in Europe, which is, uh, which is a big thing, so it's not easy to get. Um, I think the other way is uh, accession to the European Union, which will uh, help us a lot. <laughs> so. so do you think George is going to make it into the EU? I hope so at some point in time. I think it's, uh, so it's also my dream, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. It's sort of heading, heading, that, uh, heading that way. So um, somebody asked a, a, a question that uh, I also uh, was going to ask. 
um, in a different way. Uh, what was your most memorable mistake? What was what was the biggest mistake that you you ever made in this uh, in this business realm, and, and and what did you learn for it from it, if anything? Yeah. So um, I think the mistake we are making over and over again, unfortunately, it's a really really it's a big one. It's not a small one, and we're not learning. Is we're hiring too late, are not senior enough and not aggressive enough so um, and because I mean I'm surrounded by Germans and they are all conservative so they they feel like like in six months we need to become profitable but you do not need actually we have so much cash on our accounts we definitely do not need to think about that and what it leads to is uh, you are not catching up with your business model complexity and have a lot of uh, recruiting backlog and also the backlog increases uh, the whole time. So uh, hire more aggressive and hire more senior because you lack seniority in, in, in a young company, of course. Okay, so so you had cash, you had you had funding, but <clears throat> your other partners were sort of slow, and, and, and you know you the three of you were too were too slow in getting like really great people at the right time. You're saying yes. Okay. Yes, that's, uh, um, th this brings up a question. You're mentioning the sort of German founders you, you, you worked with. What, what's it like being a Georgian founder? Like, do you see, do you see your Georgian culture uh, coming out in, in some of the ways that uh, you are in the business? Yeah, so what we do as a, as a tradition, um, unfortunately, uh, not in the last, I think, last occasion. So, uh, like, at every billion we achieved, we're going to a Georgian restaurant. Um, uh, it's always the same restaurant. Uh, fortunately, they moved in Berlin, so the space was not big enough. Now we fit in with hundred something people still fit in there. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the Georgian tradition we have. Another tradition is, so we of course have done management offsites in Tbilisi, uh, actually in rooms, in the conference room, just over the, over the uh, yard. So you've done side. Yeah. meetings of Raisin here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's management cool. meeting of Raisin we've done here. Uh, we, um, and uh, the uh, things which we're doing, they are a bit Georgian. So for example, we have this community of banks and bankers, and we bring them together for a two-day event, which is, of course, a bit about content and showing our product, but the majority of it is eating and drinking, and uh, people really like it. So people also in Europe get, uh, love to get drunk, so uh, that uh, helps me to be sales a lot. So, but, but, but is this, is this, in the business world, is this Georgian hospitality, like just people eating, drinking, having a good time, I and mean, isn't that kind of a waste? Like, it don't, isn't that just like a waste of money, or? Um, like, especially for us, absolutely not, because if you sign up large organizations, it's a completely, it's a people's business. So, um, the no pitch deck and no analytical business model will help you to get an okay from a guy, so, or a girl, so you need to get them on a personal level, and the best way to get on the personal level is to socialize with them and uh, yeah create opportunities for that cool 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 yeah we we, we be I believe the same thing that this bonding of people is a very important part of a uh, very important part of business um, <clears throat> so I, here's a, a good uh, practical and inf informational question what kind of startups uh, do you or would you in invest in yourself like, are you doing angel investing, and, and what uh, tickles your fancy? Yes, so I'm, uh, I'm an awful investor, a really awful investor. So at some point, I really started to believe that I'm smart and I really understand fintech. Uh, uh, and um, so the history of that is I've done two investments. Both of them I didn't want to do, and I was socially forced to do. So first investment I've done was a associate on one of my teams at McKinsey who said, uh, Thomas, actually I want to leave um, and I want to found something. What would you do? And I said, yeah, go out, found. It's, I was myself thinking of founding, so I said, like, uh, the world is so big out there. And he said, okay, I'm founding, but will you invest into my company? This was, oh, like, will you invest into his company? I don't know. Send me the pitch deck. It turned out it was number four copycat of the same business model of food delivery in Germany. Um, so I had to invest, and I invested like 20,000. And uh, uh, what, what unfortunately turned out that they took over the whole market, so it's Delivery Hero, now publicly listed, IPO'd. So um, it was a very, very good investment. Um, the second one was very similar, also a former colleague from McKinsey wanted to go out, I helped him, and at the end he asked me, would you invest? I also invested, 
very good exit in Switzerland to a large insurer, so I felt like I know it all. So I started massively, I've done, I don't know, 15 or 18 investments, mainly into fintech. So um, I think majority of them either failed on the way to failure or will not give great returns. So I realized I'm not a professional of this, so um, yeah. But uh, I love investing, yes. And, and did you do those through um, some organized angel group with a diligence process and stuff, or did you do those as an individual, or how did you, how did you get into those? Actually, so uh, um, I'm doing mostly individually, and um, uh, so some of them are really great companies. So I'm invested, for example, into a company called Billy, once again from a McKinsey, so I know personally it's um, doing actually quite well. Um, some of them come through like um, a chain in network, so like someone pitches to someone and this guy forwards to me. So that um, uh, I've invested also through a fund, so Rebit allows its uh, founders to invest, so I also invested into a Rebit fund. So I think professionals do the job better than like common people like me who has half an hour to have a call with a founder somewhere. Uh, so um, there are some people who are spending real time on this, yes. Yeah, and that's, that's something that's happening kind of now in Georgia is um, looking at how to get, you know, sort of organized processes where, you know, an individual investor doesn't have to spend as much time uh, to get to kind of to the bottom of the, the business. Um, so a couple more questions. Um, how, how hard would you say it is to break into the EU um, from Georgia? You know, so there's this big question, and, and you, you are focused in Europe. Um, there, there are startups who are, are in Georgia and are growing in Georgia, and then there's a big pull from a lot of a lot of the Americans who come here to say, "Oh, you got to be in Silicon Valley. You got to be in Silicon Valley." And yeah, there's a ton, a ton of venture money there um, <clears throat> if you're the, you know in the right place at the right time. Um, but what would you say about entering, for example, the, the the European market or or the U.S. market as a Georgian founder? Um, so I think. Um so for, for us and, and for me personally, uh, th I think there is a one way to think about entering uh, outside markets is how to make your product um, a licensable software so that others can use it and you are not yourself selling uh, and building up the whole value chain. Uh, and that's something which we also started asking ourselves three years ago. Uh, and I think given that our market is small, rather very small, and very peculiar with the language, you cannot reuse much of the stuff. Uh, so that uh, I think uh, a, uh, like you can deliver a test on the local market that always makes sense. At the same time, you have to think what is the B2B channel, how do I develop APIs, how do I license the, uh, the product uh, so that I'm not dependent on, on the single market or my capacity to roll up market after market, which is very tedious uh, at the end. So figuring out a way that you can provide that license and other people can use the, the technology, they can do the sales stuff in their localized way, and okay. That's one way of thinking about that, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's not something you hear a lot about here, and I think it's a very good, very good point. Um, so yeah, two more questions. Um, one is, uh, what's next for Raisin? Um, you, you raised a little bit of cash, what, 114 million? Uh, did they give that to you in like hundreds or fives or like? I didn't count, but I think it came in bank transfers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's no fun. I didn't like pour the pour the buckets of cash. Um, yeah. So where do you see your your you know your company in uh, one year or, or three years out? Where where are you headed? Yeah. So um, actually, every time you uh, achieve a certain stage, uh, you need to to deliver a bigger vision because um, I think w like what Americans are great at. Uh, uh, when all, all the time I go to to, to to the Silicon Valley, I'm really amazed by how visionary and persuasive people are. And when then you ask about the real business, then it's like a fraction, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. And Europeans are the other way around. So you tell the next tiny story clue, but uh, you need a big vision. So what is our big vision? Because we are telling that otherwise it's very hard to raise uh, uh, big money, is that we want to make uh, online digital private wealth completely different. In the interest of clients, delivering the best product, the cheapest uh, and uh, best value in the investment side, and all of this convenient, digital, and a very minimum, uh, um, uh, very small minimum amounts. And uh, yeah, and that we want to do globally, of course, at some point in time. So that's uh, the vision for Raisin. 
<clears throat> and, and so that's an interesting, you, meant, you, you sort of mentioned uh, the wealth, wealth uh, management as, as, as a context. And so you're doing deposits and you're also rolling out some new products in the investment arena, yeah? So we rolled out, uh, May last year, we uh, rolled out our first uh, robo-advice product. So um, it's an automated investment solution. Uh, it's the cheapest by far in continental Europe. So it's all in 0.49% uh, fees, including for ETF and index funds aside. And that's just the first product. So we want to build, bring one further product this year and then two products per year, uh, all around the topic of investing on the fixed income side, credit exposure, uh, um, uh, uh, longer term uh, uh, savings, pension savings. So we want to have a full suit of what a normal guy needs actually for, for his 50,000 or 100,000 uh, in Europe. Great. <clears throat> and so you, you now have, uh, what, 12 billion uh, of deposits, 12 billion euro of, of deposits. Where, where, how big do you have to get before you want to sell? Like, where, where, where's your goal now, and, and when do you see exiting the company? So the market is 12 trillion only on deposits. If you count in the investment stuff, it's 18 trillion. So uh, my calculation says we're below 0.1%. So <laughs> very, very early stage. All right. So, so we, it's got to be trillions before you want to uh, sell. A whole hundred billion at least, yes. <laughs> Just a little bit, a little bit. Okay, great. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's have the last question, uh, which is, I think, one that is very important to this audience. What advice would you give to, to people in Georgia, young people or people who've had a little more experience, but folks who want to found companies and want to grow significant companies? What, what, you know, two pieces of advice would you give them, uh, you know, from your experience? Yeah. So I think um, in the um, what what makes the uh, uh, like what is the necessary precondition for for uh, for a startup success is the quality of the team. Uh, so that uh, think a lot before you found with whom you found and whom you are hiring because that can kill you as well. So with the best and brightest idea, without uh, without an able team, uh, you will definitely fail. Uh, so the bright idea is actually a good thing to have, but the team is even more important. Um, uh, I think the second thing uh, is um, what I observe on uh, teams which fail. So I had like as mentioned a couple of failed investments and two of them have completely the same topic. People are not pre-planning and structuring in their heads. So the business in both cases was going like this, but um, they started uh, thinking about raising the next round just one or two months before the money uh, was out. Um, and, uh, and they didn't ask anyone. So it was like a good first angel round and then and then they said, oh, you know what, I mean, the numbers are good, so we would be able to raise fast. You, ne you never raise fast, so you need a lot of time for that. So really thinking and structuring on what is your runway, how much time you need, um, how much people you need for that phase, what are the KPIs you're working against, so what do you want to show you in your next pitch deck. Um, uh, and uh, that actually, and then you reverse engineer and build back from that. So if you have your next pitch deck, you probably have a very good idea where you're heading for the next 12 to 18 months. Great. All right, so it sounds like really getting the right team, getting folks who are, who are super solid and who you en enjoy working with, hiring people as well, uh, quickly and well, uh, and also knowing how much you're going to need uh, to raise the next round because you don't, you don't want to run out of cash because that's the, the death knell. Um, so um, we're going to do a round of applause, but then we have a, a couple things after that. So first round of applause. Thank you so much. Very, very good, and we'll have some time uh, at the end uh, for networking. So uh, Guido is going to say a couple words, and I'll, I'll wrap up with a thank you for the sponsors. Uh, so uh, thanks for the amazing speech. That was very inspirational, and I hope everybody is at least as much excited as I am. Uh, just on a closing note, I want to remind you of three of our core principles. And the first and the most important is make friends not contacts. So this is not over yet. We're going to have a networking hour after this. And I encourage our exhibits to stand at the exhibits as well because not everybody had a chance to see you and to understand what you're doing. And please get to know different people who, do, who you do not know now and make friends. And also 
for the next time, I have several favors that I want to ask you. A, please register ASAP because we had to uh, postpone the registration again and again and again because of this high demand. So that's number one. And number two, please, whenever you hear about the Startup Grind event, this is all about community. Thomas' speech was amazing, but Thomas is going to go back and he's going to come back after a quarter. And we still are going to be here for the three months and then three months and this for the rest of uh, many of uh, for many of our lives for many of us some of us will go definitely so what i'm saying is the community can help each other out so if you know someone you can connect to that's very uh, valuable not everybody needs cash you may know someone who know who has a lot of cash you may know someone who has a good developer you may know someone who has a good ux uh, designer whatever that is so please be proactive because that is very important. Take first step and be as helpful as you can. This is what grows this community. This is what brought us here and this is what I think will get us to the next level. So thank you all for coming and make friends, not contacts. <clears throat> Great. <clears throat> Um, and so we, we had a, a few of the sponsors speaking in the beginning. I really want to uh, thank the U.S. Embassy uh, in Georgia. really want to thank Bank of Georgia, who both uh, brought uh, Tomas uh, to Georgia for the meetings and uh, sponsored uh, some amazing uh, events uh, in partnership. I want to also thank Teliani Valley. Let's get a, a, hand, a hand for the line there. Uh, I think we may have some more uh, coming out later. They have some really uh, nice wine that they provided us. Um, okay, we have a lot of wine, so we need to drink it. Um, also, if, uh, if there are folks from Orient Logic who are in the room, wave your hand. Orient Logic is, woo! All right. Orient Logic has been uh, one of our longer standing partners. Uh, also, uh, uh, Crystal has been a long standing partner. Um, Ilya University, Ilya State University, has been a wonderful partner as well. And we're getting into some new things. There are two announcements I would make that uh, are things to keep an eye on. One is there will be a program called Venture Elevator that we're partnering with the Embassy and Ilya and Gita, some different folks. This is for startups that want to get to the next level, so keep an eye out for Venture Elevator. And in November, we will be having a one to 2,000 person international event in Belize. So stay tuned for that. We're organizing sponsors, international speakers for that. I uh, want to thank our other sponsors, Rooms Hotel. Let's give a hand for Rooms Hotel. They provided us this, uh, this very graciously in this room and, and made a lot of accommodations and sponsorship for us. Uh, also, let's thank Terminal, where we do a number of our events. Uh, Polytra Media, Georgia's Innovation Technology Agency, Entrepreneur, and 4P House. 4P House did all of this printing for us to make the stage beautiful. So let's give them a hand, 4P House. Go forth, network, help each other!